Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Growing Up in Scientology. All right, we are chatting today with Mark Headley. Hi, Mark. Hey, guys. So we wanted to do a short little video to answer a question that's come up um, of why is it that some people, you hear the stories, and some people have to escape from the sea org, and you hear their story of escaping and planning an escape and being chased and shit, and other people, when they tell their story, they just left. Like, in my story, I just... I say I routed out of the Sea Org, I left the Sea Org, I was able to still be a Scientologist in good standing after leaving. And in Mark's case, and this is why I wanted to have Mark do this video with me, Mark staged a dramatic Indiana Jones style escape from the international <laughs> base. <laughs> and if you haven't read Mark's book, um, Blown for Good, uh, check it out. It's, an amazing, it's, it's really an awesome book and a really good depiction of life at the international base. Um, so let's just tackle this question, Mark. Why do some people have to escape the Sea Org and some people are able to just leave? Well, the people that have to escape, I think mainly are either from people that are at the international base. You're, you're basically privy to super hypersensitive information, such as that's where, da that's where David Miscavige lived for many years. Um, he has a house there at that property. That's where L. Ron Hubbard's house is, like his main house that they built, I think 20 years after his death for him to come back and live in and where they set his clothes out each day and every morning. Um, that's where his house is. So um, you're privy to, the, I mean, the amount of things, that's where they edit uh, the L. Ron Hubbard lectures. So all of the recorded lectures, that's where they have the, original copies of those or backup copies of those uh that's where they edit them that's where they produce them that's where they produce all the films that's where all the propaganda uh advertising and it's all directed from that property so you have a lot of information that you you're aware of and you also that's where all of the international statistics so every week in scientology they tally up all the things they did and they send them up to the organization above them. And all organizations send it up to the organization above them. And it all ends up at the international base. All of Scientology International, anything they did that week. And uh, so you see how they're contracting and they've been contracting and getting smaller uh, since about 1996. That's when pretty much everything started going downhill internationally. And you can see that there because those statistics are posted at that property. They're, they're actually on the walls. You see graphs that are just dwindling down and down and down. So you know Scientology shrinking at that property. You're well aware of those facts. So because of all these things that you're, you're privy to, um, they don't want people to leave and tell other people about that information. So... There, 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 when I was there, there was razor barbed wire t around the entire property. They have security gates that are manned by security guards, uh, either remotely or guards at that actual physical gate. And um, in order to leave, you have to have approval to leave. You can't just walk out, even though they'll tell you, oh, you can just walk out whenever you want. You can't. And if you do, then you're considered blown and they'll chase after you, so on and so on. So what would happen though, if somebody did just walk out? How, how would someone just walk out? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna head off my own question with sort of a statement. One of the, the key factors here is whether you want to continue to be a Scientologist after leaving the Sea Org. If you really don't give a shit about continuing to be a Scientologist, is it possible to just walk out of the base. I don't think so. I think, and and that's a it's it's sort of also dependent on what's happening at that time. So, if David Miscavige is at the property, no one is allowed to blow. Period. If someone's going to try, how, how would somebody walk off the end base? I mean, there, it is surrounded by fence, and there is a guard booth, and the fence is kept in a closed position not an open, all are welcome position. How would somebody leave the base without permission, without jumping over the fence? 
I don't think there's a way to do that because the all you got to be sneaky about it. Like Ron Miscavige, he was yeah. in, in a habit of driving off of the base. He had permission, and he just took a well, left instead of taking a right. Yeah, he would drive across the property. So the international base is split by Highway 79, California Highway 79. So if you want to go from the south side of the property to the north side of the property, they have to open up the gate, and then they open up the gate on the other side of the property, and you just drive across the highway. Right. So, and this is the way most people escape, is they're going to go across the highway, because once you're on the highway, you're kind of like, you're free for like five seconds before you get to the other side. So you have this brief moment of freedom while you're crossing the highway. And every once in a while, somebody will be like, screw it. And they just pop pop a, a turn and they're going down the highway. Well, turn once, left, you, turn once, left. Once, you, once you do that, that's when the, the blow drill fires up. Because they see you. You're on camera. And they're also waiting for you on the other side so they can close it after you go through. So as soon as you go left, that's it. It's There's no... Like, there would be no situation where you you would say to the guard booth, hey, it's Mark, I'm going across, that, that they would be like, okay. And if I didn't go across, it's like, he's blowing. There's no other scenario where if I don't go across, I'm not trying to escape. Right. So then they send people. There's a rover. So there's a rover on a motorcycle, and there's a rover in an SUV. And those rovers will, if somebody goes off, climbs over the fence on foot, then the rover bike goes after that person. If somebody gets off the property in a vehicle, then the rover truck goes after that person. Right, right, right. And so in my case, I escaped on a bike. So I had a motorcycle and I escaped on my motorcycle. And so the rover truck went after me and ran me off the road and the police came. And that's, that's basically the only reason I was able to escape was because the police showed up. Right. So if the police wouldn't have shown up, I would have ended up going back. So, so there are there have been people like the gate has been open, and somebody walked out. Like sometimes the gate is just open. Oh. Like if like at lunchtime, there's a lot of people going back and forth from the property. So sometimes they'll leave the main gate on the south side open because so many people are coming in. Or when people are coming in in the morning, when there was buses, when we lived in apartment buildings or there was people that lived off site of the base and the buses were coming through the gates, the gates would be open. So those, because they couldn't just keep opening and closing them. As they'd see the buses coming, then they open the gates and the buses would drive in one after the other. So in those times, people would walk out the gate and just start walking down the highway. Right. And then... They'd have a, a minivan or a security truck or somebody just kind of drive with the person on the side of the road until the person was like talked back in like, hey, man, you don't want to do this. Hey, you're never going to see your family again. You know, they there's a whole spiel they have of all the shit that's going to go sideways if you keep trying to escape. Right, right. And they run that dialogue until you get back in. So there have and and. We were making a list one time. My wife and I were making a list one time of all the ways people escaped. And the funny thing is, is that Claire, when she worked there in RTC, she made that list as part of her job <laughs> to find out the way that most people escaped so they could figure out how to make it so people didn't do that anymore. And one of the, and, and which ones were more successful and which ones, you know, running, get, running over jumping over the fence is one of the least successful ways to escape because sometimes you're going to get injured by the razor barbed wire and also you're on foot and they already have the advantage of the rover bike and the rover truck and it's not the easiest way to escape unless you do it in the middle of the night when something else is happening blah 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 so um but claire found their most successful way was a doctor doctor appointment so there's and there's been people there. I'm telling you, I don't know exactly. I'll, I'll, I don't know exactly what's going to show up on the next season of the aftermath. But hopefully there's. It's an escape story that I heard about. Hopefully that ends up on it because it it is an amazing 
escape story. Um, and there and there's so many different ones that are amazing. It's hard to say I, I hope this one or that one, but some of them are pretty epic escapes. And um, and so yeah, so at, in LA or Florida where you were at, let me jump in real quick. Jump in real quick, and yeah. then we'll pick up that thought. Um, because I also I don't want to create the wrong impression. Some people might have the impression that everybody at the int base is just waiting for that fence to open to run out and that the guards are like, keep it closed, keep it closed. Like you were at Int, uh, the Int base for a, at least 15 years, right? Or some t- somewhere there. You were the head of a- 15 sh- years. You were the head of a shoot crew. There are many times you could have escaped um, if your mind had uh, been at that place, right? What is your, um, what is your comment on um, uh, the people at the end base and whether they're really all just waiting for a chance to escape. What are your thoughts on that? I I think that there there's a uh, there are a few people there that are in that category, and those people. <laughs> this is funny because so those people are put on a list, and it's called the restricted list, and it's made up of a group called the uh, the people that make this list are called the perimeter council and which literally means the perimeter of the property the perimeter council and and the purpose of the, the these people are to keep people within the perimeter of the property the people and not to escape do they call them um, a blow risk they're 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 considered to be a secu- um, they're uh, a what a security threat or a security risk right um so it's because they're going to leave and that will be out security because then they're they're going to escape without authorization and then they're going and they're disgruntled or they're there's something si- sideways about them that they're a threat because if they get out they're just going to talk shit about all the stuff that happens there and in many cases they've talked shit while at the property like fuck dave he's an asshole he's driving scientology into the ground this is not what i signed up for boom you're on the perimeter list you're on the you're on the blow list as a as a threat and so those people those people are under watch. Uh, there's varying degrees of under watch. They're either under 24 hour watch, like they sleep in a location that has guards posted. Right. So yeah. when they wake up, they go, let's watch this guy. Cause it's in the middle of the night and he's up. He's gonna try and jump over the fence or whatever that, that he needs to be watched full time because he's gonna try to escape. Right. Okay, there is a list. Like if someone's like in trouble They've just been maybe removed from their post. Somebody sits outside in a chair at night while they're sleeping to make sure they don't just leave. Yeah. Um, that's the, so they have the exact same thing at the end base. Yeah. And 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 it is that. It's anybody who's um, who's had thoughts of leaving. So if you're in a, in a session or a security check and someone says, hey, do you, do you want to leave? And it reads on the meter or you just say, yeah, I, I want to get the fuck out of here. Then you go on the list. If you get taken off a post or if you're involved in any sort of justice action, you've had a committee of evidence and you're going to get punished or you're possibly going to get assigned to the RPF or the Rehabilitation Project Force, which is like a labor camp, a prison camp. Um, Any of those types of people end up on this list and they're watched. Okay. And at the time when I was there for a majority of the 15 years that I was there, there was birthing or staff housing off of the property. So if you were on the perimeter list, you couldn't even go home. You, d- you had to stay on the property. Even if there was no place for you to stay, you still had to stay on the property. If you slept under your desk or, like I slept under my desk for about, or in other places around my work area for probably a year or, or more throughout my 15, throughout the 15 years. And one, I'd say one time I ha- probably had an eight month stretch where, for eight months, I stayed on the property, or several months, I stayed oh, yeah. on the property. So, to discuss this subject, let's keep it personal for a moment. For you, you escaped. What would have happened if you went to your, I'll try not to use the terminology, but the person in charge of personnel and ethics, and you said, I want to leave, and I'm not going to change my mind. What would have happened and how would it have turned out? Okay, well, in my case, I did that as well. So in b- probably 
14 years before I escaped. When I first got to that property after just a few months, maybe after six months, I did exactly that. I said, I'm out. I want to leave. I'm done with this. I don't care what happens to me. I'm out. I'm done. And they said, okay, you're going to be declared a suppressive person. Um, you're going to never speak with your family ever again. You're going to owe us a lot of money because you have a freeloader bill. When you do, when you join the C organization, any training or any courses you do in the C organization, you get for free. Mm -hmm. You don't pay for it. But if you leave, they charge you for those. Right. So which, let's do a quick... Which is, which is illegal, by the way, in many states. Right. That is, it is illegal to char charge for on-the-job training. So let's do a, a quick compare and contrast. Because one of the, the things that comes into play here is that there are certain people, especially like you said, people at the international base are um, aware of particularly sensitive information. And I'm aware of people who used to be at the international base who were then demoted to PAC, which by the way, for everyone watching, is the slang term for the L. Ron Hubbard Way organizations. And it's Pacific Area Pacific Command. Area Command. Um, okay, so we call it PAC. I'm aware of former international execs who were demoted to PAC who stuck around because they were told if they ever left the Sea Org, they would be declared. Whereas your normal Sea Org member, when they go to their HR department and say, I want to leave, there is a process to go through. It can take a long time. It can be humiliating, but they are not declared as long as they follow the right procedure. Whereas some Sea Org members are told, no matter if you follow the right procedure or not, if you leave the Sea Org, we will declare you. Peter Specker, no, not, not Peter, Ken Mortensen is yeah. I, I know of who... Um, Everyone on the base knew that he was told if he ever left the Sea Org, he would be declared. Well, he um, used to be the uh, COCMO Gold. He was WDC Gold. He held a lot of, but now there there is a reference for that. So in Scientology, anytime L. R. H. L. Ron Hubbard wrote anything, it's called, you, you refer to it as a reference or a policy. And there is a policy in Scientology where L. Ron Hubbard say you always, he says you always leave the door a crack open. For anyone who leaves Scientology, we always leave the door a crack open so they can come back in. Well, for the property, um, L. Ron Hubbard wrote a bunch of things. And because he wasn't supposed to be running Scientology at the time, um, any of those things that he wrote during the 1980s and I think the late 70s are called advices because he wasn't supposed to be telling us what to do. So it was considered just advice like, hey, but any but an advice holds the same authority as a policy letter or anything else that he wrote. So it's really a moot point. But there is an advice that L. Ron Hubbard wrote that he says that anyone who leaves from the int property, not only do we shut the door, we bolt it and weld it shut with an, like an atomic branding iron. So, or a, a whatever. He says you don't, that door is closed forever. Right. And so based on that, that's where the you're get, you get declared a suppressive person right. if you leave the ant base. That's where that comes from. So let me ask and you. So, let me ask you this, Mark. Um, yeah. I was under the impression, and just correct me if I'm wrong, that there are Sea Org members who have routed out of the Sea Org from the ant base and are to this day Scientologists in good standing. Who's that dude? Jason Benick. So yeah. why? Give me just explain for me and all of uh, those watching. How should they think about why some people from the int base can route out of the Sea Org and yet you still hear of people escaping? Okay. In the case of Jason Benick, he was an executive at the int base and I'm pretty sure he worked in RTC or in and around David Miscavige in the early years when David Miscavige was sort of rising to power. And David Miscavige has seen and done stuff with David Miscavige that David Miscavige absolutely under no uncertain terms wants anybody to know about. Okay. So Jason and, and Jason. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Jason Benick is he knows stuff that I don't even begin to know about. Okay. Um, in terms of nefarious activities of David Miscavige, including David Miscavige beating the shit out of him on a regular basis. Okay. So. He's a good example of somebody that 
we're going to let him go because he's a, uh, he, he's, and he was always in trouble. When I was at the base, he was at one point, he was my boss in the early 1990s and, and he ended up going to the RPF and he'd already been on the RPF multiple times or at least once or twice before that. And he's, he was always in and out of trouble. And he's a little firecracker, that guy. He would get he he could get stuff done, and most of the time he'd go for a few years, and then he'd get something done that he wasn't supposed to get done, and then he'd get busted. Or he wouldn't get something done that he was supposed to get done, and then he'd get busted. Anyway, for people like that, they get them to sign an agreement, they get them to take a payment, and this payment could be five hundred dollars, this payment could be three hundred thousand dollars, depending on what that person knows or has been involved with, that person gets paid and that person signs a document. And because that person is taking a, a payment when they're signing that document, that sort of more legalizes that document to, yes, if you say what you know, you're gonna get sued and we're gonna sue the shit out of you. And in a lot of cases, even people like me that were at the int base, we were under the impression that we signed a document that if we told anything we knew about the int base, then they were going to bill us fifty thousand dollars. Sure. You don't know that that document is completely one hundred percent illegal and void and has no authority, but they want you to think that. So the people that know, you know that I know that document's bullshit. That person's going to get a check. Right. And 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 there's been people in since I left because what happened was before two thousand five. There were very few people that had ever left the inner in, in base that ever spoke a, a word about it to anybody. Right. In 2005, that changed hardcore. And, and actually, I was trying to create like a sort of group of people that we would share stories and tell as many people as we could as much as we knew about the int base. And so what they ended up doing was Tommy Davis, who used to be the international spokesperson for Scientology, and several other high-level imp-based Sea Org members, they went around and they made a list of any person that had ever been at the imp base ever in its history. And they went and tracked these people down one by one and they gave them a check and they got them to sign this document saying, you're not gonna say anything about the imp base. And this was in the, in the late 2000s. Um, and so now when people escape or when people leave or, or Another, another way to get out of there that wasn't ever really used was to get pregnant. Right. So in the days that we were there, if you got pregnant, you had to get an abortion. If you didn't get an abortion, then you were put on the decks and you were made to be a dishwasher or do hard labor until you finished routing out, which basically is admitting to any and all sins that you had so that they could document those and use those against you if you ever did decide to speak out. And they still got you to sign saying you're not gonna say anything. And then they sent you to a Scientology organization to work there so they could still keep an eye on you. Right. And um, and then you could have your baby or whatever. There What's that? Uh, just when you lean too far forward, it cuts your bottom part of your face off the screen. Oh, don't want that. <laughs> okay, so now uh, one thing I'd like people to understand is that even uh, uh, people like Jason Benick, it's not like they just go, I want to leave, and people just like, oh, shit, here's some cash, and you're out the next week. It's still a humiliating and long process. Is that correct? Yeah, and in his case, he was actually offloaded from the property because he was such a flat ball bearing that they were – they didn't want to – he didn't want to – David Miscavige didn't even want him at the property anymore. So he was sent to a property in California with about, I want to say, eight to ten other people. And they were all sent there from the ant base and they were supposed to build a Narconon. <laughs> like they were in the middle of the forest at a Narconon at a, at a, just a, like a kind of a resort facility. And they were supposed to renovate it and turn it into a Narconon. And they created all kinds of shore flaps and problems in the community. And it, it just, it, it was like, let's get rid of these guys. Cause they're making such a mess here. Let's make them go build a Narconon because they can't screw that up. Well, they screwed that up with epic proportions. And then from there, I think most of those people either went to the RPF in Los Angeles or Florida, or they were just kicked out of the Sea Org altogether and gotten to sign this thing. Right. So Jason Benick, 
um, he did the RPF, then he came back for a little bit, then he screwed up something else, then he went off to do this other thing. And so he had already been like being knocked down the totem pole over years and years and years until basically he had no authority, he had no stature, he was basically just like, oh great, you know. And just as a funny comment on uh, Miscavige's uh, non-existent managerial skills. So, Jason Bennett, I don't know the guy very well, maybe he's an asshole, maybe he's a piece of shit, but, you know, David Miscavige chews him up and spits him out and kicks him out, and now he's like the CEO or senior vice president at a giant tech company down here in Clearwater making shit tons of cash. So, I mean, that's just a comment on what a shitty fucking manager Miscavige is, where you should be able to train and hat people. You should be able to train people and get people to do good work. Miscavige kind of does the opposite. He just chews through people and spits them out. Um, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not endorsing Jason Bennett. I'm saying this is, but it's also a kind of a funny uh, commentary on how someone can spend so much time in the Sea Org and still and, and be considered a piece of shit and still come out and make a, a, a very good living in the real world. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, almost. I would say 95% of the people that I know that were at the Ant Base and that left and got a regular, you know, regular job have been very successful in life and have done awesome for themselves. There's a very, very small percentage of those people that don't end up doing that. And most of them are the ones that are still sort of involved in Scientology. True. They're, they're in their and Scientology. Too. That's right. And Scientology uses that to kind of keep them in a, in a spot where they then they do perform like they said they would if they left. So they, a lot of, at the end base, the, the, the sort of thing that was set talked about was if you leave here, you're either gonna be a bum or you're gonna be flipping burgers. Like that's gonna be your thing. Right. And, and so a lot of people think, oh, I'm, I'm a horrible person. I can't do anything. I don't have a high school diploma. I don't have any education. So yeah, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to go flip burgers, which by the way, um, is not a bad thing. <laughs> I would love to go work and flip burgers out compared to the Sea Org flipping burgers is paradise. Okay. Right. So, 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 and you're making, and you're making more in one day than you'd make in a whole week. <laughs> so, um, I, I guess to kind of put a point on this for a lot of people at the end base, they know or believe that even if they try to leave the right way, they're still going to be declared and kicked out of Scientology. So why the fuck would you submit yourself to months of humiliating interrogation, giving them all the ammo on them they could ever want on you, instead of just figuring out how to get the fuck out the front, the, the front or the back door? That's why you hear those stories, right? Yeah, and that's also why at, you, what you just said is exactly what people started realizing. It's like. Okay, hold on a second. So you you mean if I run out the gate and say, fuck you, I'm out of here. I'm going to get declared. I'm going to have a freeloader bill. I'm never going to talk to my family again. Or I can stay here for a year, tell you all the stuff real or imagined that you or I have think I've, think I've committed acts of wrong against you or whatever. And then I'm going to end up getting declared and a freeloader bill and never talk to my family again. So a lot of people are just like, you know, let's let's just cut to the chase here. I want the package I'm going to get no matter which way I do that. People basically, and that's sort of how this give you a give you some money and get you to sign a document. That's sort of how it evolved to this. Right. Because the end game is exactly the same. So we might as well just get there. It's going to be the most efficient for both parties. If we give you $50,000, and this is the best part. If you think that you're an SP and you did all these horrible things and you just want to leave and you don't want to do any, you don't want to cause any trouble, they're going to make you pay them 500 bucks. They're going to bill you 500 bucks. So they're going to say, get somebody you know, one of your family members to pay us, to give you $500 so you can pay us $500 and then sign the documents. Okay. But if you know that Billy Bob over here just got 50K, you can say, hey, I want 75K or I want 100K. The craziest story I've heard, and I don't know if this is told how accurate it is, but there was a woman who worked for David Miscavige that was, in, what was running this project with Tommy Davis and these other Sea Org members to round up people and give them a check and get them to sign and, and do all that stuff. 
Well, that woman ended up leaving. <laughs> and since she knew that basically it was all dependent on how much the person thought they wanted. So if the person said, I want 20 G's, then they might have haggled them back and forth and said, okay, we'll give you 18,500 or whatever. But if the person said, I want 100 G's, they're like, oh, come on, that's insane. That's insane. We'll give you 75. Well, this girl was like, I want 300 K. That's it. Right. And supposedly she got a big check to leave. And, and, and she only got that because she knew that she could. So that I heard a story of a couple that left recently and they each paid the $500. And this is after this other girl got 300 K. So it's sort of like, it really depends on how savvy or how much of a threat that they determine you are based on what you know and what you'll do. If you're a meek little meek mild person who just kept their head down and worked there for 20 years and you don't really know anything and you're not going to cause any trouble, you're going to be the person that pays the 500 bucks. Right. So would you agree that one of the fundamental differences on whether somebody says, fuck it, I'm out of here, and whether they have to do it secretly or sneakily or stage an escape or just walk out the front door, uh, uh, compared to someone who submits themselves to the proper procedure to leave, that the key difference is whether they intend on continuing to be a Scientologist after leaving the Sea Org. Yeah, I think it's the prison of belief part. So if you believe that your future salvation in all eternity and, and all of mankind is going to be threatened because you're doing this harmful act, well, then you just want to play it as, as, as safe as possible so that you can leave the Sea Org and then still be, be involved in Scientology. Right. And, and that's where the difference is. If you, if you're, and this is why it's different at the end base, because if you're in an org, you haven't seen all this insanity that happens. So at an org, the, the idea is that we're trying to create a Scientology oasis where everyone is a Scientologist. Everything you do and work with is Scientology policy. And everyone is, uh, is studying L. Ron Hubbard's techniques and his action. Well, at the end base, we have that. Everyone there is a Scientologist. The whole place is Scientology. And it's a nut house. It's a freaking insane asylum. And people are screaming and fighting. And people, Dave Miscavige is giving somebody a beat down and jumping over conference tables. And, and you know, you're seeing stuff that's like, this is a Scientology oasis. We're going to make the whole world like this crazy place? Yeah. I don't think so. That's you, what, so, you know, that's what so you, and also... You have people there at the end base that are OT8s and, and, and they can't unjam a freaking stapler. I mean, it's just like, you're just like, you're an OT8. You know, you've reached the highest level of Scientology training and processing. And I could run circles around you in my sleep and I haven't even read Dianetics. Like you see that, uh, yeah, who gives a shit about it? It's this? kind of we amazing that anybody... anybody leaves the Sea Org at the end base and continues to remain in the Church of Scientology. Let me let me tell you a funny anecdote. Um, Jonathan David is a guy who grew up in the Cadet Org and the Sea Org in Los Angeles. Um, His dad is Andy David. He was a cook at the end base. You want to know who he's married to? Who? Uh, Jessica Leak, Lori Hodgson's daughter. No. Yeah, they live in, I think, Austin. Um, so, uh, you know, he grew up in the cadet org, so he was, uh, he was aware of all the child abuse and the molestation and the kids being sent out to work in the fields in the middle of the night when he, and he, you know, he didn't leave the Sea Org until his twenties, but when he went to, uh, security and said, I'm leaving, I want to leave the Sea Org. And they said, if you leave, you're going to be declared. And, um, Jonathan said, oh, is that right? Um, why don't you take a look at, um, some of the thoughts I've jotted down here about my time in the cadet org. If you declare me, I'm going to publish these. They looked at it and said, okay, you can go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and here's what's crazy. Jonathan David knows all the terrible shit that was done to these kids in the name of Scientology. And I say in the name of Scientology because everything that was done to those kids was, quote, unquote, based on L. Ron Hubbard policy about the Sea Org and cadets. And the motherfucker still remains in Scientology putting on this show because he's now married to a Scientologist. And before he got married, he was like an under-the-radar dude. 
he was one of these guys who wasn't really a Scientologist. You know, he was connect, and, and then now he has to put on a show because uh, you know, and he's on course at the Austin Org. This is how shit. This is how this shit gets perpetuated because the people who know better pretend like they don't. Yeah, and and that that is exactly what happens. They play along to to stay in like good good sorts with their family, and so they can talk to people. And that is the biggest. That's the biggest leverage that the Sea Org and Scientology has. It's control um, through family. That's the biggest. The disconnection policy is pretty much the biggest card they play on a routine basis with anyone anywhere, public, Sea Org, staff. If you leave, you're never going to see your family. You're never going to be able to talk to your family. So those people, they know it's bullshit. They've seen bullshit with their own eyes, and they say, okay, well, I, I want to be able to talk to my mom. Right. And so, and that's really, at the end, that's the silliest part of all is in 1990, I said, I want to I get out of here. And they said, you're, not, you're going to get declared. You're never going to see your family again. You're going to have the freeloader bill, da, 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 da. When I left in 2015, it was the exact same thing. Right, right, right. Or 2000, two, when I left in 2005. Yeah. It was the exact same thing, except for I was at the point where I was like, I don't give a shit. I've, I, I'm in the Sea Org at the end base. I haven't talked to my mom in forever. I, I, I don't give a shit about Scientology, so go ahead, declare me. Um, all, you know, all the other points where they're like, that were threats are sort of like, that's, a, that's an actual brighter outlook than what I'm dealing with here. So I'm going to go for that, and I'm going to sacrifice that. And, uh, and yeah. Yeah. So what I'd like to do um, is just think of some other instances of stories that we've heard of people yeah. who would qualify as escaping and just very briefly explain uh, that person's situation. So, like, Marty would be just like your situation. He knew there was no way for him to leave without being declared anyway. So just fucking leave. Um, yeah. Okay. Mike Rainer and he left. In situation. He, he left multiple times, too. Right. Marty oh, and that's and that's another thing that they have as a thing at the end base. If you've blown once, you will blow again. Mm. So that person sort of gets a little extra attention. When, when shit goes sideways, you got to watch that person. And even when there's just a general atmosphere of you're all fucked at the base from David Miscavige, as soon as he says, you guys all suck and I'm thinking of declaring you all, any of those people that have blown before... Uh, the, the executives and the security people keep an extra little eye on those people. And that was sort of, they get recovered. They blow and then they get recovered. And that's why the book is called Blown for Good. Because I'm gone. You're never going to get me back. Right. Okay? I'm blown for good. This is not a repeat thing that's going to happen where I leave and come back and leave. No, no. It's done. I'm blown for good. Yeah. So, but yeah, Marty, Mike, same thing. Mike is an interesting one as well because... He would. He was regularly leaving and going it to different countries and to Los Angeles and to court cases and meeting with lawyers, and he would get bitched out by Dave. Like, if you don't sort this out, you're gonna. You, I, I will make sure. You know that you're miserable. And then, he, then they'd send him away. <laughs> and Mike did this. Mike did this for years, which I can never figure out. Because you know, if you're at the base and you're like a staff member like me. When you get in trouble, you're on lockdown. You don't go anywhere. Here's Mike, just got the shit beat out of him by Dave Miscavige at a meeting, and now he's off to, to London. And you're like, how 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 does how does that work? Like, how can I get how can I get out like that? How so that yeah, like Marty. Um, I'm trying to think of some other people, but like Jeff Hawkins. Hawkins. Yeah, go ahead. Jeff Hawkins routed out. And so, but okay, but now you commented earlier, once David Miscavige decides he doesn't really want you around anymore, he will let you route out. Is depends. Not, not quite accurate? It depends. It all depends. And that's the thing about David Miscavige. If the wind's blowing east today, this is the way it is. If it's blowing west, it's a totally different way. It does, there's no but rhyme like, or reason. But like Jeff had a long history at the end base. He had a good production record. I've, I read his book. I just don't remember the details of him of him routing out. I just don't remember the details. Well, the crazy thing about Jeff is that we'd be in a meeting and David Miscavige would say, this motherfucker needs to go to the RPF. And then they would pick him up from the meeting and he would go to the RPF. Like, right, like that's how hardcore it was at the end base. Like you could be in a meeting and end up on the RPF. And then we'd be in another meeting like a week later, 
and it would be like, why is this fucked up? Where's Jeff? What the fuck? How are we going to fix this? And everyone's like, fuck, dude, you, you sent Jeff to the RPF. No one's saying it, but we're thinking, well, yeah, you, you sent Jeff to the RPF last week, motherfucker. He ain't here no more. That's why this is all fucked up. He's the only person who knows how to do this Dianetics bullshit. Right. And, uh, and so then he would say, well, I want to meet later today with Jeff, and we're going to have to sort this out. And everyone's like, okay. And so this is the craziest part. Jeff's been on the RPF for a week in, in L.A. They go down to L.A., get his back, get his ass back up there. He's like tan. He's like he's been he's been sleeping every night. He's like he looks like a totally new Jeff, like a week of sleep and some sun. Oh, Jeff's brand new anyway. And Jeff comes into the meeting at six o'clock that day like nothing happened. Like we were just meeting with him. And he's like, yes, sir. So I figured out what the how we're going to fix the demographics and how the what media buys we're going to do. And you're just like, what the fuck? That's and, and Dave, for people so to understand Dave, in base, that it got so bad, the RPF was kind of like a vacation. Oh, no, it's a 100%. Anytime anybody went to the RPF and then they ended up like something like this happened, we're like, Dave, like one time Dave said about this one guy, his name was JDV, John DeVries. He was the cine secretary. He was over the film uh, shooting division. And, uh, or he was an executive over Cine. I don't remember. He jumped all over. But anyway, Dave said, like, this guy should probably be on the RPF. He said that in a meeting. And so after the meeting, the guy was hauled off to the RPF. And then we were in another meeting that same night. And he said, hey, why isn't JDV here? I'd be like, because he went to the RPF. He, used to hold his... he said, I didn't say send him to the RPF. I said he should be on the RPF. <laughs> so you're just like, just like, oh my god! So that happened all the time there at the property, and so that guy was on the RPF for like 18 minutes. Like by the time he gets to LA, hey, this guy's gonna go to the RPF. Oh no, never mind. Get in the van. We're going back. <laughs> Come back to the property. <laughs> Do you remember whether Amy Scobie and Matt? Um... Did they are these did they do this thing where you're on the RPF and they just said that's it we're done like kind of like Debbie Cook like if I'm not out of here fucking all hell's going to break loose and that's another yeah. example where some people on the RPF honestly just wouldn't have the uh, I'll say patience for lack of a better word to like uh, insist that they do right like um uh, you you could be on the RPF having a terrible time and be like I got to get the fuck out of here and yeah. escape or you could be on the RPF and, and kind of do what? Stick it out. And just be like, I'm leaving. And sort of make them make you do it the right way. Or, or, or whatever. Yeah, well, Matt, I, I don't know. If, have you ever met Matt? Oh, I know Matt, yeah. Yeah, he's a giant. He's huge. Like, he could crush your hand. You could crush your head with his fist, okay? Like, just, <laughs> um, he's giant. And I think there was some sort of physical thing like, uh, we're leaving or... You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna Hulk out on you guys. Like, <laughs> so it was it, that was sort of the the flavor of right. their their like, okay, we're leaving, and that's 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 the end of it. And then that and you know they they gave you know they did whatever they did so that and I, I'm sure they made them I don't know if they made them sign anything, but I'm sure they messed with them. But they if they eventually got out that way just by saying, um, we're not staying, and if you make a stay, then it's going to get ugly. Right. And there's a lot of people, and, and see, that's another thing. A lot of people don't even know that that's a thing you can do. You, If you've grown up inside Scientology and you've lived there your whole life, you don't know that that's an option. Like, hey, you can't keep me here. Right. Like, I can go. Right. And if you keep me here, I'm going to tell them that you kept me here. And right, right. as soon as they know, and that's where, that's this prison of belief thing really comes into play because as soon as you know that you hold all the cards, you hold all the cards. And up until that point, they have all the cards. Exactly. So until you know, it's it's all in your mind. And, they, and they'll even tell you that because we tried to sue them for keeping us there. And they said, no, you could have left anytime you wanted. And you go like, well, I, I probably could have, but I didn't know I could have. Right. You, you made me think that I couldn't. Right. So yeah, and that has to do with your state of mind. Because let's say there's yeah. some, let, let's just take for example a Sea Org member at PAC. This is totally hypothetical. Um, yeah. The, the state of mind of a Sea Org member is not only are you a Scientologist, not only are you fully dedicated, not only are you fully bought in, 
you're the you're the most elite of the elite. You don't just go from being a Seerg member to being like, I'm going to fucking walk away from Scientology and never go back for no particular reason. Like, it takes a lot to get somebody to that level. But theoretically, if somebody did flip that switch overnight, a Seerg member could walk out the front door of Los Angeles Org or Asho or whatever, walk up L. Ron Hubbard Way, walk down Sunset Boulevard, uh, the security guard on his bicycle could be following right behind you the whole time, trying to talk you back, talk you back, talk you back. As long as you just ignored them and kept walking, it's not like they'd knock you down to the ground and cuff you and throw you in a van and drive you back. Like like you said, they only have the power when you think they hold the cards. Exactly. It's all in your mind. So when I go to the when I go to these properties, like I went to the Ant Base a few years ago with a film crew. And instead of attacking them and instead of like going aggro, I just showed them pictures of my kids. So I'd like, here we are at Disneyland, you know? So when I went to the property, a bunch of people came outside onto the highway and they started screaming and yelling at the film crew and at me. And I was just like, I just tried to keep it as chill as possible. I was like, hey, you know, here's, here's us at Disneyland. Here's, and, I, and I told them, you guys would be amazing in the real world. Like you guys can make so much bank. The first month I was out, I made more than 15 years here, okay? Like, you guys could do this, you know? If they know, instead of saying um, Scientology is bullshit and Scientology is evil and all this other stuff, that my, my way of talking to them is you will be successful in the real world because that's the thing they tell you. You're going to be flipping burgers or you're going to be a bum on the street or you're going to die. No, I'm like, no, you guys would be amazing in the real world. You can make tons of money. Don't listen to anything they tell you. And don't even talk about Scientology. And that's actually what I even did with Claire. When she was still there and I was out and I was trying, and we had, had secretly managed to contact each other, I didn't say, you know, Scientology's bullshit. No, no, no. I just said we could start a family. Uh, I got sleep last night. I watched 17 movies this week. You know, like, I, I, was, I was trying to, like, like, get them to picture or get them to visualize how they would succeed out of that environment and how they would be happy and successful out of that environment because that's the exact thing they're being told will not happen if they leave Scientology. Right. So, and, and also, in Scientology, they're also programmed that anyone who attacks, you immediately go, ah, you turn your brain on defense mode and don't listen to anything that person's saying. Uh, saying that you're going to be successful in the outside world, that's not really attacking. If you walk outside this gate, your awesome level goes up about 100%, okay? Sure, sure. So it's not an attack. And so it kind of short circuits their programming if you tell them, if you, if you're, if you, if you play it cool with them and, and you're just analytical and don't get aggro. The aggro is what sort of short circuits everything, and it never works. Sure, sure. Uh, in fact, I mean, well, the point that you're making here is um, has everything to do with why the tone of the videos and the conversations I try to have on the channel is uh, is very measured because I, I I have the concept that my intended audience is people who are on the fence and still in Scientology, and if sure. those people stumble upon a channel and the person sounds fanatical and crazy and is just shitting over every part of Scientology and L. Ron Hubbard, they go, oh, these guys are just as suppressive as we were told they were. But yeah, if you're having and a that's a good, that's a perfectly good point because when you tell those people, oh, Scientology is a Scientology, fine. If you do exactly what you said and they do end up leaving, they will come to the correct conclusion about Scientology after getting out of the bubble. Right. And even the people that leave that are still like, oh, I'm totally for Scientology and this is awesome. You go like, okay, okay, <laughs> it's all good. You know, just like, just get a job. Let's do this normal stuff. And then two years later, you're talking to me. Oh, yeah, I can't believe I believe, you know, yeah. that, you know, so it, they'll get there. Yeah. So a couple of things. Um, I, I, I want to I, I think of um, the situation that Nora, Nora Beth Crest, or she's married now. Nora Ames found herself in on the RPF where she attempted to get out of a space and she was physically restrained to a point that caused physical uh, damage to herself. Um, and then wound up in a situation where she uh, decided her only way out was to drink bleach. And I think at that point, it was probably a combination of things. I should ask her directly. Some people do that because they want to scare the church into letting them leave. I don't think most people who do that in this year are literally trying to end their life. 
Um, they're no. normally doing it. Well, one, they're sort of having kind of a break. They're like, they're like, I can't take it anymore. I don't know what to do. I got to get out of here. It's a, it's a, it's a rash decision. But so that's an example though, where she did attempt to escape. She was restrained and then felt she had no choice, but to do something drastic so that they would make her leave. There's one of the fastest ways out of the series to tell people you're having suicidal thoughts. They're, you're, you're, yeah. you're out of there that night. Yeah. And they had that at the end base too. I know of, I would say at least three people that I know of that did the exact same thing. The bleach one, if you drink bleach, that's it. Because because there has to be a level of commitment. Like having a thought about leaving is one thing. Drinking bleach is like, we need to get this person the hell out of here. Now, now that you say that, I have to tell you one other story about the fastest way I've ever seen anybody get off the international property. Right. Okay, so this person was in marketing at the hip base. And he was in a meeting with David Miscavige. And David Miscavige, like, either he was getting sec checking already, or he ended up getting sec checking, uh, security checking by something that he did in a meeting. I don't know exactly how he ended up getting sec checked, but in the sec check, he admitted that he was thinking about, he was daydreaming about David Miscavige giving him a blow job. <laughs> in in a meeting with david miscavige okay this guy i mean as soon as the words blowjob came out of his mouth in the session it was like okay we're gonna end off and it was like they took him from the session he went into a van and he was driven off the property <laughs> so he's like if you want blowjobs you can suck cock on hollywood boulevard <laughs> yeah so that and and guess what this guy was the most he was the most heterosexual guy that I ever knew, okay? And I, regardless, that was the best way to get off the property. If you think about David Miscavige doing something, like not, he wasn't doing something to David Miscavige. No, David Miscavige was doing it to him. <laughs> that, it, it's it's just the nuances of, of the thoughts and also that he was daydreaming ab about it in a meeting with David Miscavige. So David Miscavige is talking and he, all he can think about is like, nom, 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 nom. Like, this was the fastest way to get out of the air base. Do you think and, he and just I, made that up? Do you think he just bullshitted his Oh, life? yeah. I, I, I actually consider it the most brilliant, like, like there was, was no... Like, it was just the most demeaning thing he could think of to say about Miscavige? But there was no, there was no anything. It was like he got chauffeured off the property. It was, he did his stuff got packed for him. Like, <laughs> like, like it was like, it was like he Ubered. He, he mind Ubered off the property. Yes. He said, this is what I thought. And they were like, well, thank you very much. You can now leave. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, and guess what? The guy's a successful entrepreneur. He's, he's living life. He's, he's, he's doing well. And so it does work out. Yeah. It I know a guy back. I knew a guy. He was just like a kid. He was like 16, 17. And in a session, um, and, and you could tell this kid was not quite right, to be honest. But he said something about having thoughts about harming David Miscavige. The kid had never met David Miscavige in his entire fucking life. But he says that, boom, gone. Yeah. Instantly. And that is also... I don't know if it was always like that, but it did evolve where at the end base, if you got a sec check, you got asked if you had any thoughts about David Miscavige, if you had thoughts about harming David Miscavige, if you had any like evil intentions about David Miscavige, like half of the sec check was about David Miscavige, if you were at the end base. Yeah. So he was seriously, seriously paranoid. And, and, and this is the best part is that he would say sometimes I know you guys are SPs, you know, you guys are trying to do this or trying to do that. When something, oh, and by the way, that story about that guy, I got told that by David Miscavige. The blowjob story? Yeah, yeah. I didn't hear that from somewhere around the base. No, <laughs> David Miscavige told that story at a meeting. Like, he's like, oh, you'll never guess what happened yesterday. And he just like, oh, what? And he's like, tells a story. And I'm like, and I was thinking, dude, you just... You just told everybody how to get the fuck out of here. Just now. You just told everybody in here the best way to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. 
So if I were to summarize it this way, let me know if you think this is an oversimplification. If someone says, what's the difference between whether someone escapes or whether someone routes out, it seems to me that it's two factors. One, how much time and embarrassment are they willing to subject themselves to in order to get out of there properly? And two, do they have any intention on continuing to be a Scientologist after leaving the Sea Org? The answers, how one answers those two questions depends on whether one feels they could or should escape versus leaving the right way. Do, do you think that's too simple or is that pretty accurate? No, I think that's accurate. And then I'd go to say how quickly they allow you to leave is based on what information or dirt or threatening uh, things that they were involved in. Like, so at the end base, everything there is pretty threatening that you know about. Well, if somebody was in Los Angeles and they know about some so sort of sexual misconduct or maybe about uh, some assault, sexual assaults, or if they know any sort of thing that was covered up or they were involved in, then that person could also be subject to more scrutiny or more harassment if they did end up escaping. So it really is, if there's somebody who worked in Tampa, Oregon was passing out flyers and they decide they wanna leave, it's like, okay, leave. Like it, it's not gonna be no big deal. But it, as you go up the line, that's where it gets complicated in terms of how they let you leave and how much they harass you or keep track of you after you leave. Yeah, and kind of like what you commented on earlier, you also have a hybrid situation where someone can escape like uh, Indiana Jones style and then they're convinced to come back and leave the right way that even happened. yes that's absolutely happened and that's the craziest part is some of those people they do leave in a spectacular fashion they get brought back and then they just stay forever they don't even leave again they stay again like there's a guy who crashed through a gate with his car at the at the in, not at the in base but nearby they had a place called the ranch or happy valley which was where they'd send the crazy people they'd send them to happy valley and this guy drove out the gate in his car and the gate crashed and cut his face and it was a whole big thing and he stayed there for like another five ten years after that crazy and you're like isn't that the dude who bust through the gate yeah he's, he's a big uh, boss the, the other thing that you mentioned of marty um marty rathman having left more than once that's an interesting aspect of that weird sort of jilted lover relationship between marty and david miscavige is that the concept that somebody could blow the int base and then still be put on as like his number one deputy after that when normally if you've blown you're not even eligible for senior management anymore well the craziest part of all is that marty blew right after the the irs win right. that marty was like he david miscavige thanked marty on the stage when he announced that they won the irs win the you know the tax exemption and then right after that marty's like Beer, see ya wouldn't want to be ya and then he took off they got him back and then he was like well no he went on a sabbatical mm. to the ship so yeah so then he went to the ship and they sent somebody there to do his sabbatical with him. And then that lasted for how many ever months or years. And then he went back to Florida. And so he pro he progressively came back. So like that happened in 93 or 94, end of 93 or beginning of 94. He goes off, does this, he leaves, then he goes and does a sabbatical. Then he comes back. And then I think by like 95, He's back on the base. He's yeah. back in RTC. He's a big head head honcho again. And you're just like, I thought this dude like drove off on his motorcycle. You know, like what the heck? Yeah, he was at Flag in '96, as we were told, he was the president's RTC. Yeah, he was doing the uh, Golden Age of Tech stuff. Yeah, and he's also the one that was handling the Lisa McPherson right. debacle in Florida yeah. for Dave. So that, which is kind of crazy. So Marty leaves because everything's bullshit. He goes off to, f the f they send him to the free wind so he can be wined and dine and do courses and be an auditor and all this other stuff that he always wanted to do. And then when he comes back to Florida, David Miscavige throws him on the Lisa McPherson thing so he can get his hands dirty. And David Miscavige doesn't have to have his fingers in any of that, any of those pies. Right. And then anyway, yes, you're right. There is a, there is a love hate there with those two yeah. that, uh, that I still don't understand to this day. 
and it has taken some crazy twists and turns in the last few years. But um, yeah, uh, definitely. So yeah, that's another great example. Marty blew on two occasions and apparently has come back into good graces after both times. Yeah, yeah. Even the, nuts, even this last time. It's not. It's Which is nuts. even crazier. People ask me all the time, like, what's the deal with Marty? And I'm like, I don't really know. He, It looks like he's being pro-Scientology now, but they still have hate websites up on him. And he's still got so, some hate videos up on them. Yeah, and he still has all his original videos up where he talks shit about them. Right. On his video, on his, so it's like, you just like, you know, when people say I'm confused, I'm like, me too, man. I have no idea. I, I'm, yeah. I'm just as confused as you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, man. Well, um, uh, thanks for having this chat with me. And uh, to everybody watching, I hope that um, uh, answers the question. And uh, anything else? We all good? I think we're good, dude. I'll, uh, I'll see you later. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Let me, know, let me know if you guys want to talk about anything else. All right, bye.